further ado, I do want to now introduce um, Maria and Alan to come to the front um, and, uh, and lead us through the morning keynote. So Maria and Alan, um, thank you very much for agreeing to do this. Again, the topic is health equity. I'm very interested in hearing what they have to say. I think this is critically relevant for all of our work going forward. Um, and now, um, Maria and Alan, the floor is yours. And again, thank you all for, for coming. Good morning. Um, this is a, um, a hallmark day, at least for me. I have not been in a room with this many people, and I have not had on shoes or regular clothes um, below my waist. Um, so I'm excited to have the opportunity to be here, and I really appreciate, um, Chuck, um, your introduction and, and your leadership in, in facilitating what I think is a really com important conversation. Um, a year ago, when this conference was held virtually, I'm sure most of us didn't, were really skeptical that we would be meeting in person um, and um, really doubted when, whether our, our ability to, to predict when this might um, actually come to an end. Now, um, you know, I think everybody here has probably listened to the radio on the way here. And, and so in spite of the recent uptick um, in COVID positivity rates. I'm personally clinging to Dr. Fauci's um, assessment last week that we're nearing a transition out of the full-blown explosive pandemic and we're entering a more controlled phase in, um, in, in democy. A year ago at this conference, it was apparent that nationally and in Maryland, certain communities were bearing a dis disproportionate burden of, uh, from COVID. In Maryland, it was clear that early in the pandemic, black people experienced excess cases, excess hospitalization, and excess death compared to the percentage of the population in this black. So too, at the national level, Kaiser Family Foundation analysis of national data on COVID-19 rates and deaths has shown that people of color have experienced a disproportionate share of the burden of cases and deaths. And cumulative national data over time shows persisting disparities for Hispanic people and deaths for Black people. It's the same case for Hispanics where nationally, Hispanics represent a larger share of cases relative to their share of the population. Kaiser data from Maryland showed that as of April 22, white folks had a reduced burden in cases to their, to, to their, compared to their share of the population, whereas Black and Hispanic but um, populations had increased burden. Uh, one example, 33% of cases compared to 30 um, for black people and 17% of cases compared to uh, the 11% population for Hispanics. Research at Johns Hopkins showed that early on in the pandemic in Maryland and in DC that of nearly 6,000 patients who tested positive for COVID uh, 42% identified as Hispanic, while 17% identified as Black, and 17% identified as other, compared to 8.8% as white. Dr. Kathleen Page, one of the lead authors and co-directors of Central Soul Johns Hopkins, explained that, the, that the, most of the patients she met were not only eligible for benefits, had no health insurance, and rent rooms in crowded houses the need to work, lack of occupational protections, and crowded living conditions have all led to high transmission in this community. There is no doubt that when viewing COVID pandemic through a health equity lens, the health status disparity experienced by black people has been exacerbated. As the former Surgeon General David Satcher said in November of last year, the pandemic has highlighted disparities and access to care. It is also highlighted that some groups have more health conditions like hypertension and obesity. So when COVID hits them, it hits harder and COVID has attacked those most vulnerable in our society. Dr. Satcher went on to say that the disproportionate impact on other groups like uh, American Indian 
Alaskan natives, Hispanic, and white people living in poverty or in rural areas show that disparities are at play not only in terms of race, but also in terms of geographic, socioeconomic. I mean, none of this information is, is new to anyone in this room, but um, th this is uh, the opportunity, I believe, to really embrace um, what I call as a, a silver lining. Here in Baltimore, mere days into the pandemic, we launched a robust partnership, including Johns Hopkins, Care First, and OMS, that not only helped us navigate the early days of COVID, but allowed us to, to create innovative ways to mobilize uh, vaccination efforts to reach Black and Hispanic populations. That's a silver lining, that from this work, we can begin to, uh, to, to, to build the cornerstone of, of, of information and strategies that we know have worked and continue to deploy those strategies that we use during the pandemic. This past year or two has seen a sea change in the recognition of the devastating impact of health disparities, as was validated by our, um, our speaker, Alan Wheel, who noted at the National Academy of Medicine conference that health of health equity is the most vital direction for 2021. During my short stay at Hopkins, I've been encouraged to see that addressing health equity is a key component of our work to build diversity and inclusion. And over the past year, we have doubled down in um, building leadership, um, creating champions internally for equity and, and leaders across the, the organization. Health Affairs has taken a leadership role in an extraordinary way in addressing the issue of health equity over many years. They've, they've appointed Dr. Vabram Watts as a director of equity, devoted the February issue to uh, a theme of racism and health with a, uh, the focus on structural racism. And they've taken the additional steps of forming health Ac and health equity advisory committee to guide uh, the journal with developing and implementing strategies to advance equity within scholarly publishing of health services and health policy research. They've also launched a health equity fellowship for, tra for trainees program to advance racial equity in health policy and health services and in scholarly pu publishing. It's for that reason that I am so delighted to, uh, to, to have the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker, the editor-in-chief of Health Affairs, Alan Wheel. Alan has been editor-in-chief of Health Affairs since June of 20, 2014. Uh, Health Affairs is a multidisciplinary peer-reviewed journal and, and is the nation's leading journal at the intersection of health, health care, and policy. Wheel is also the director of the, the Aspen Institute's Health Strategy Group. Previously, he was the executive director of the National Academy for State Health Policy, an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit research and policy organization. Director, he was also director of the Urban Institutes, uh, assessing the new Federalist Project and held a cabinet position as the executive director of, Col of Colorado's Department of Health Care Policy and Financing. He earned his degree from the University of California, Berkeley, a master's degree from Harvard, and a JD from Harvard Law. So without further, further ado, I am pleased to introduce um, Alan Wheel. Thank you, Maria, and thank you, Chuck, for the invitation. Uh, I, too, have trouble tying my shoes this morning. Haven't done it in so long. Uh, it's uh, odd to be back up in front of folks uh, physically, but also a real pleasure. Um, I'm going to say at the outset, uh, I used to give a lot of speeches in the world, and there's certain rules you're supposed to follow, and I'm going to break them all here. Um, I have w way too much material, and I'm going to go through way too quickly because I'm trying to set the stage. Um, mostly, I think I'm going to show you things you've seen, which is why I'll go quickly, but I want to slow down in places that I hope will serve as a foundation for some of your conversations later today and, of course, beyond today. Uh, so my presentation, if we can get slides, so is 
entitled An Evidence-Based Approach to Health Equity, Social Determinants of Health and Racism. What I find is, I think for good reason, the health sector right now is focused very much on equity, which is a great thing. It's focused very much on social determinants of health, which is a great thing. Our country is focused on racism, which is a critical uh, and great thing that we're focusing there, but we're kind of jumbling the three together, and my goal is to offer some evidence to help us think about how to separate and join them and hopefully do better in all three areas. So my thesis is fairly straightforward. Achieving health equity requires addressing the social determinants of health. I'm sure this is not the first time you've heard that. Traditional approaches, particularly health sector oriented approaches to addressing social determinants of health are useful. They're instructive, but they are also quite limited. Population phenomena, and I uh, please forgive the sort of bland language there, but racism is an example of something that's population wide, it's not a medical condition. Uh, those population phenomena require a different approach. And here we are in Maryland where you have this unique infrastructure that gives you opportunities to uh, approach health equity that simply aren't available elsewhere. And I hope you'll get more deeply into that topic in your conversations today. So I'm gonna go super fast through the population health inequities because you do all know this, but we do need to remind ourselves at the beginning of every conversation as we're trying to improve equity that population health inequities exist all along many dimensions, uh, geography, rurality, urban, central urban, income level, wealth, education, race, ethnicity, insurance status, social relationships. Inequities exist um, in, on so many dimensions. This is an example of national data showing life expectancy at birth, uh, higher rates for whites than black Americans. Um, and if you look at your own Maryland data, you see the same uh, sustained large inequities in life expectancy. But um, there are other dimensions that we need to look at. Here is a life expectancy by educational attainment, a direct positive correlation between higher levels of education and higher life expectancy. Here is activity limiting chronic diseases, a direct negative correlation between income and the number of chronic conditions that limit people's lives. Uh, here is child well-being, not being in very good or excellent health, directly correlated with income. These go on and on and on, and I go through them quickly again because there's so many examples we could use. Uh, the challenge in approaching health equity is that the mechanisms by which population characteristics translate into inequity are complex, they're interrelated, and they're often bi-directional. And the key example there, of course, is that poor health can limit your ability to earn and low income can limit your ability to access healthcare services effectively and healthy behaviors, and therefore you have a bi-directional relationship. Um, so the challenge is if you want to have health equity, you can't just target one dimension of the population and say we're gonna fix that and we'll have equitable outcomes. It just doesn't work that way. Um, and so that leads us to looking at the social determinants of health. And again, I will do this quickly because these concepts I'm sure are familiar to you. I do want to note that the World Health Organization of the definition of social determinants of health is worth a moment's pause. They are the conditions in which people are born, grow, work, live, and age, and the wider set of forces and systems shaping the conditions of daily life. They include economic policies and systems, development agendas, social norms, social policies, and political systems. I think it's important to remind ourselves that the WHO conception of social determinants of health is much broader than the way we tend to use the term in the United States. If you ask people in the US, what are the social determinants of health, they'll say housing or income. Certainly those are true. But look at uh, economic policies and systems, social norms, social policies. I, I think if we're serious about taking on social determinants, we have to have a broader sense of what they are. And I might add, I'm not a big fan of the term social determinants of health, but since it's used broadly, um, I'm going to use it here. So why do we focus on social determinants of health if we want health equity? Because we know 
that clinical medicine, medical care, is responsible for, according to review by McInnes and others at the National Health and the Institute of Medicine, only responsible for 10 to 15 percent of preventable mortality in the United States. And hopefully you've seen this chart or something that looks like it prepared by the Wisconsin Institute uh, on uh, population health, where they've tried to use evidence to disaggregate the origins of, dis of, of health inequities. And what you find is that life and healthy living are only slightly derived from clinical care. They're more derived from healthy behaviors and social factors and social context. But all of those, again, are interrelated. And they're all complex. And one of the things that frustrates me a bit about the conversation about addressing social determinants is uh, health, the health sector sort of jumps in and says, well, we'll solve this problem. Well, these problems are incredibly complex. And there are people who have devoted their lives and careers to trying to address them. And we're not just going to be able to parachute in as health sector folks and fix them. So just to take a simple, I uh, mean that, example, what's the relationship between education and health? Well, people who've studied this find it to be a highly complex relationship. Again, it's bi-directional. Educational attainment affects your ability to pursue healthy behaviors. It affects your work context, which affects your income and resources and the health of your workplace and your ability to uh, provide for uh, healthy conditions. And it affects your social context, your information context. I mean, just education as a social determinant of health is incredibly complex. And if you go back and look at the various determinants, housing, income, healthy uh, environment to live in, uh, all of them are highly complex. And so uh, let's not imagine that we can just fix them, but let's take seriously the need to address them. And if we take them seriously, that leads us, if we're concerned about equity, to, I think, a very reasonable place. And the reasonable place is that because there's a high correlation between race, ethnicity, and income and wealth, then if we address the social determinants of health, which are heavily tied to economic disparities, we'll improve health equity. And this is, I think, a reasonable sort of mathematical formula. If you improve housing, if you improve education, if you improve employment conditions, you will be addressing conditions that we know can be barriers to people being healthy. And because poor conditions, whether they're work, environmental housing, are disproportionately a burden borne by uh, people of color in this country, we will, by definition, reduce uh, the inequities that exist in healthcare. And so, again, hopefully you've seen these data, they're very easy to find, but we know that household income is much lower for black Americans than it is uh, for on average, and it's lower for Hispanic Americans than it is on average, and it's higher than average for, for whites. Um, and we often focus on income, but the disparities are actually much larger when you look at net worth, and net worth is a huge factor in the disparities that we see because it provides a cushion for against bad times and it allows for investment in health promoting behaviors and the like. So we have this highly inequitable context. Um, if we can address the social determinants, we will improve equity. And I think that's true. And I think it's good that we understand that. And I think it's great that the health sector is taking it seriously. So that leads to sort of what I call the traditional response. And the traditional response fills about half of every issue of health affairs, so I can't really do it justice in two minutes or three minutes here. But it, I'm going to give you two examples of which there are hundreds. One is a piece uh, in JAMA Health Forum entitled uh, Promoting Health Equity by Paying for Social Care. So what do we do? We say, Health sector, you're trying to improve outcomes. In order to do that, you need to address social determinants. So you need to assess your patients and figure out what parts of health promoting life they don't have access to and go help fix it. And we may pay you 
uh, more for outcomes rather than procedures. And so you have an incentive to find those uh, patients of yours and figure out what investments to make. That's sort of the traditional, it's accountable care, it's pay for performance, it's outcome-based payment, uh, it's moving from value to, from, from, sorry, <laughs> let me get that one right, uh, moving from volume to value, uh, you know, it's all, it's all over healthcare. And we could talk about it for an hour, I would actually love that, but I don't have time. Uh, here's another example, and I was peripherally involved in it, and so I love it and I hate it. Um, and it's a project uh, funded by the Commonwealth Fund, which I have to like because they're a supporter of health affairs, but it was a return on investment calculator to basically figure out if you're a health system, where's the evidence to show that if you invest in these social determinants of health, you'll get a positive financial return, and therefore this is an investment that you ought to make. And uh, this is available on their website, and it, you can plug in all kinds of variables, and, it's great. So my question is, will these traditional strategies produce health equity? That's part of what hopefully we're doing. And here's where I'd like to spend time, and again, I'd like to spend more time than I have, but I want to tee up for you some thoughts that maybe aren't the ones that you always hear when you go to health conferences. My response to whether or not these strategies are going to produce health equity equity is that they are certainly directionally correct. They will move us in the direction of health equity, but they have huge limitations. And here are a few of them. First of all, they're panel focused, as in I identify my patients who have a barrier and I try to overcome it. We hear this, how many of you have heard the refrigerator story, right? We have a patient who isn't, uh, um, I'm sorry, the, the air conditioner story is more common than the refrigerator story. There are lots of great stories. You have a, you have a patient, uh, a kid with asthma, they keep coming in, and uh, you find out uh, that the best thing you could do to reduce their asthma is to buy them uh, a, um, an air conditioner. That sort of perfect individual patient panel response to a, to a, a barrier to health but it's not really answering the question, why do so many kids in our community live in homes where there are asthma triggers, right? That, you're, that's not the question that the health system is going to try to answer. Um, I have a big issue about return on investment calculators, which is why I have a love-hate relationship with the Commonwealth Project. If in order for a health system that's being paid for health outcomes to consider it to be a positive return on investment to invest in a social determinant of health, you have to count the investment as what the health system does, and the return is health benefits. But what if that investment also helps the family thrive, get a better job, uh, be happier, God forbid? Those don't fit in a return on investment calculator. You don't see the return, and so I think return on investment calculations directed at the health sector dramatically undervalue social investments because if the return isn't returned to the health system, it's invisible, it's not counted. And so we don't do things that are really good for people because the ROI inside healthcare isn't there. All kinds of temporal challenges. Um, Long-term health effects, lead abatement, uh, pollution reduction, things that can have immediate effects but also have very long-term effects. Who's going to pay for those if I'm going to move from one health plan to another, if I'm going to move from one health system to another? It just doesn't, it's, it's not a priority. All kinds of design challenges. Uh, we, we give you the financial incentive to improve outcomes. We measure it across a large population. You increase the average by addressing sort of the easy stuff. You're a little better off but maybe the inequities remain. Maybe they even grow. Uh, maybe uh, you target um, popu uh, conditions that are predominantly a burden for more highly advantaged people because they're easier to take on. And there are opportunities for unintentional harm. Uh, if you're paying providers on the basis of outcomes, we know 
that some providers find ways to shed their patients who are going to cost a lot of money. I know no one likes to talk about it, but everyone who's been there has stories to tell. These are real challenges. They're not just theoretical. These are barriers to paying the health sector to solve social problems. Um, and I think if you look in the pages of health affairs and read about the performance of accountable care organizations, they're perfect examples. They save a few percent. They make good investments. They're directionally correct. Are they solving our equity problems? I, I don't think so. Are they comprehensively addressing social determinants? They're certainly not. And then my favorite topic, which I have to stand a little bit further from Maria, as I say, is the power dynamics here. The health sector is highly conservative. And I don't mean that in a political sense, I mean it in an institutional sense. And really good at hoarding resources. So with all due respect to Johns Hopkins University, if I want to solve poverty rather than give Johns Hopkins money to solve poverty, I'd rather take money from Johns Hopkins to people who actually know how to solve poverty. That's just me, um, sorry, but that's sort of how I think about it. I mean, the health sector is not real good at sharing resources, and if you go into the actual rooms where health systems are trying to work with community systems to address social determinants, you see how many resources we have held for fancy offices and good salaries and great benefits and how few resources people who are draw, trying, to, trying to address hunger and poverty and housing who are meeting in the basements of, of churches and who are on fold-up chairs and who are working for, you know, 50% less than most of us in the room. That's the reality. And so when we say to the health sector, go solve these problems, you're new at it, you don't really know much about it, but go work with these folks, you control the purse strings. I don't think that's a formula for success. You can tell I would talk about this a lot longer if I could. This is my concern, is that it's good that the health sector cares about these things, but I don't think it's gonna get us where we need to go. So the overall result is you get financial incentives that are directed at the health sector to improve health outcomes. If they're designed properly, they should improve health equity. But the movement towards equity is gonna be limited if it doesn't address the population phenomena that underlie inequitable access to the resources that enable health, which brings us to the topic of racism. So racism is a system consisting of structures, policies, practices, and norms that assigns value and determines opportunity based on the way people look or the color of their skin. This is not the only definition, but it is one that I think is very compelling and very evocative. It's not sterile, and I think that's important. Here's what I want to say, and I'm going to try to slow down, but I don't have time to slow down much. So racism is a complex multidimensional phenomenon with myriad direct and indirect effects on personal health and health equity. Social phenomena are messy, they're complicated, it's not one thing. It operates in conjunction with and independently of primarily economically based social determinants of health to create and sustain health inequities. And I'll come back to this in a minute. I just wanna tee it up here and I'll come back also to this third comment, which is that racism is complex, but it's no more mystical than other phenomena to which we attribute great power, like economic incentives. And I say that because as an editor of a research journal, we get a lot of pushback on, can you really study this stuff? And it's like, we study a lot of stuff we don't understand very well. And we can't put racism in a different category and say, well, we can't study that because it's messy, it's complicated. I think that's a bunch, I think that's, Anyway, okay, so um, this is, uh, again, not doing justice. Uh, uh, David Williams gave a presentation to the Washington Regional Area of Grantmakers in 2015. Um, I was in the audience, and this is his very complex and completely evidence-based picture of the dynamics of racism, individual phenomena, social phenomena, historical phenomena, outcomes, it's so evidence-based, and this is kind of what drives me nuts, is people act as if we don't have a strong evidence base of what racism comes from, what it does, what its effects are. It may not be as deep as it needs to be, but it is incredibly strong base. Um, I'm a simplifier, and so here's, in the context of the conversation that I hope you'll have today, this is the picture I'd like to show you. 
Social determinants of, uh, well, let me start on the right side. Health inequities arise in part from social determinants of health inequities. That's the story of the first few minutes of my presentation. Racism is a cause of some, many, of the social determinant of health inequities. But racism is also an independent source of inequity. So it operates two ways. It creates social determinant inequities and it creates health inequities. And, and, and I wish I had time, this is not the focus of my talk, but I want to remind you, I put these little backwards uh, facing arrows. It is really important for us to understand that the existence of health inequities and inequities in social determinants is also a source of racism because it reinforces the notion of inferiority of those who have less. It enables those with more to blame those who have less for their condition. So this is a cycle, and it's a really ugly, nasty, horrible cycle, and it's the cycle we've got to get out of. Now, the direct effects are many. The Institute of Medicine, again, and now National Academy of Medicine, in their unequal treatment report, talked about bi clinical bias, clinical uncertainty, stereotypes of providers. We have a lot of evidence about the harms, the social harms, of, uh, and the physical manifestation of the social harms of racism. Uh, we know, for example, and this is also from David Williams' speech, that you know, there are independent racial effects. So here is life expectancy divided by education. And on the right-hand side, you can see that regardless of level of education, there is a life expectancy gap between whites and blacks in the United States. So you can't sort of control, even as you control for other variables, you find these phenomena. So we did, thank you, Maria, we had in February the issue devoted to racism and health. There are so many ways to try to improve our understanding and quantification of the effects of racism. I think this is essential. We have to understand the phenomenon in order to address it. Um, it comes through many techniques, the so-called, what I would call the unexplained residual, as in there are differences in outcomes between a black and a white population. We control for all the variables we can think of. It leaves us with a mystery. In the United States, a lot of that mystery is tied up in racism. We have studies that look at correlations with historical practices. You can actually find that counties or regions that had higher levels of slave ownership or historical redlining have continued health effects generations later. This is real data. Correlations with practices that have a racist element. There's, uh, there's, a, there's racialized policing in the United States. You can look at the prevalence of policing practices that have racial elements, and you can see the health effects. And there's an increasing effort to directly measure racism. We can see that particularly in things like uh, uh, predatory lending practices. So there's evidence, and we need to grow the evidence base because we need to treat racism as a source of health harm and health inequities just as we do other uh, sources of health harm and health inequities. And it's not going to be discovered through a randomized clinical trial. Not that people call those the gold standard. They have their own problems. But that's not how we're going to figure this out. We're going to have to treat this as the social phenomenon that it is. So as I wrap up, I just want to say my perspective, my thesis, is that a population-based phenomenon, and racism, I think, is the core example uh, in, in our country, they respond to population-based interventions. The health sector can, and it certainly should participate, and in some cases lead those inter interventions. But the kinds of interventions that the health sector is likely to adopt are different than the interventions that actually target the underlying social determinants of health. These are uh, supporting, potentially mutually reinforcing approaches, but they are different. We need population based approaches to population-based problems, not just individual health sector approaches. And I'm not an expert on Maryland. I've lived in the DC area for a few decades. There are so many Maryland experts, I've sort of tried to stay away. I did run the National Academy of State Health Policy. I've watched and we've published many papers on 
the Maryland uh, system and rate setting system and the waiver and all of that. But even from a distance, it's pretty easy to see that you have in place and have had for a long time the basic elements of a population-based approach. The whole notion of moving from volume to value, the notion of total cost of care, the notion of trying to, to look at uh, population outcomes, that's in the Maryland conversation in a way that frankly is newer in most of the rest of the country, not all of the rest of the country. You have a rate setting infrastructure and I started my, uh, long ago, my health uh, policy uh, career started in Massachusetts where we had rate setting at the time. That gives you opportunities to create resources at a population-based level. We in, Ma in Massachusetts had a, an uncompensated care pool. We had an assessment on every hospital and we paid it back out on the basis of uncompensated care to try to equalize the burden. Those kinds of rate setting structures give you opportunities to look at what are the needs of the population, not just what do you do at the health system specific level. And so I believe you do have a unique opportunity to create resources and make a significant investment in population-based approaches. Now that's not easy. Carving dollars out of the health sector, no matter how big it is, is going to be fought and, it's, it, and it should be uh, uh, controversial. Uh, but for you, it's an incremental change. It's, it's sort of building on a structure you already have, whereas in other places that would be viewed as very radical. And I know you have some sessions over the course of the day that are going to look at various elements of this, both the, the, the racism and equity angle, as well as, of course, the waiver and the waiver renewal and the dimensions. I hope you will think about the unique opportunity you have, and I hope that well, what I've been able to present you today helps you take advantage of that opportunity, maybe think of it a little differently, and use it uh, to address uh, in a way that really no one, I think, has fully embraced at the state level yet, uh, the, the complex dynamics of equity, uh, social determinants, and racism. Thank you so much. so much, Alan. There is so much to unpack from all of the information that you just shared, and I have a, a million reactions to it. And I think the first thing that, um, that struck me as I look at this audience is um, it is a very complex issue to address and, and um, to impact in terms of health equity, and it cannot be done in a vacuum with just the health care ecosystem. And so, you know, I, I wonder, as I, I sit here, how do we invite, how do we include um, the other sectors of our public policy community in conversations where we ensure that they are looking at these issues through a health equity lens? I know that there, um, there are some jurisdictions, actually, in the state of Maryland. I know um, uh, I, this we have at the state level. Um, done some policy changes to ensure that in transportation, in housing, um, there is a health equity lens in all of the policy decisions that are made. But, but does that, is that a, stra a strategy? Has anybody done that well? Um, and how do we ensure that we, um, we provide folks with the resources to have those, um, those conversations and translate it into action? Well, that's a, I hope you don't have too many questions like that. Um, <laughs> that's a really great question. And, you know, I have mixed feelings about there is sort of a, a global movement, health in all policies. And um, that's not particularly about equity, although I think it's hard, again, to do health in all policies without an equity lens. And, and I have to admit to mixed feelings because of my concern, particularly in the United States, where the resource differential between the health sector and the other sectors is so large. Although well, housing is a really big sector too. A lot of the others are, are, are on a much weaker financial footing. Um, what concerns me about, what, what I like about it, and I'm thinking of Michael Marmot from the UK, who, who's a big sort of social determinants uh, early uh, thinker on this. What I like about it is that it can motivate uh, broader thinking, and that's sort of what you're looking for. 
Um, what worries me is that health equity isn't the only kind of equity that matters. And so the concern is if you go to the housing sector or you go to the education sector and say, we want to engage in conversation because we want equitable health outcomes. They're going to say, well, but we want equitable education outcomes and we want equitable housing outcomes and why is yours more important than ours, right? So I think what we have to do is it's sort of a both and. Right? It's like we're here because we believe in the importance of equity in health, but we are also here, maybe, we can support your goal of equitable educational outcomes. In fact, a more equitable health system should probably promote more equitable educational outcomes. So I think as long as we approach it as not come and join us in our agenda, but we're bringing our agenda to your agenda, I think that's probably more productive. I wish I had a good example in the U.S. of it. That's how I think. Yeah, the, the, the other, the other um, point that really struck me, um, and we are all having that, this conversation in the state of Maryland, is the need to do better in harnessing our resources um, that, that are unique in the state of Maryland to ensure they're invested in the right places, right? So um, it, it needs to be a conversation that um, is includes not just the health systems, right? Um, but how do you draw in and make the case to the health systems of the value of parsing off portions of those savings um, and um, deploying them strategically in the community? So this is where my, frust my concern is that if we, I get that in the real world, that's what we have to do. We have to get the health sector to consider it in their interest to send resources out to places that are going to affect things that determine people's health. It's a very, that puts the sector in a very powerful position and I'm skeptical about how many of those institutions will actually uh, share the resources. My personal view is that you need someone outside of healthcare and to push to say less here, more there. You need budgeting processes. You need constraints placed on the health sector. Um, and you need to maybe, as I said with the sort of the ROI calculator, maybe you need institutions that are designed to think about ROI in a different way than just a health ROI. Um, that then there's maybe a community pool that uh, is looking at returns more broadly, looking at them in a longer term. I realize that's hard. I'm unfortunately, historically, and there's nothing unique about healthcare, historically the health sector, like any other sector, is resistant to efforts to uh, take resources out, even if they might promote other agendas. And if you know, one of my favorite things is if you go to a trade association meeting, there will be this great presentation about equity and social determinants. But the room will be full when the lobbyist is there talking about reimbursement rates, right? I mean, that's where the energy is. So I just think I, I, I'm not, a, I'm not, that's why I say, you know, directionally correct, but not going to get us there. I think you need social commitment. You need leaders and, and boards saying our agenda is broader than our health system and, uh, and we're going to do the right thing, that's, sorry. <laughs> no, don't apologize, but because, um, you know, I believe, and I see Chuck is standing there, but, but that, those conversations are underway here in the state of Maryland. And, you know, we have, under the waiver, are, are working toward um, measurable outcomes on a number of population health. Um, factors that I think will serve as the foundation to getting closer to that. But there is a recognition of the importance of um, finding a way to better identify funds that result from the savings and deploying them in a population health manner. And that's really where I tried to end today too. And I, with, with Chuck coming up, I will end and just say, I mean, I think you do have this incredible opportunity and I don't want you to take my comments as pessimistic. They're more hopefully getting you thinking in ways that can give you optimism. And, and I know you are.
I'm, I'm sorry to rudely come up. Um, uh, I, I also think this conversation could go all day and that would be a great and productive use of the day. Unfortunately, that's not where we're at. Please join me in thanking Rian Allen for a really fun